Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Rafi Kabasum. Can you hear me? Today. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Rafa Kabasum. Today we are going to start a series of 10 lectures on anesthesiology, which is comprised of various topics. We are going to deliver one by one each topic. And today I'm going to start with the perioperative assessment and pre-medication. Are you hearing my voice? So So basically, there is going to be a series of 10 lectures in which we are going to discuss pharmacology of the general anesthetic agents, local anesthetic agents, various regional techniques, practical conducts of anesthesia, the perioperative management of the patient before, during, and after surgery, and we'll, uh, we'll also discuss the complications of anesthesia. We will we'll give a little bit touch to the ethical and legal aspects of the anesthesiology and the relationship of the anesthesiologist and surgeon. So today we are going to actually touch two different topics. One is the pre-operative assessment and second is the pre-medication. But as we are going to start this series of lectures, I must want to know that how much you know about the anesthesiology. Anesthesiology basically, it is a medical specialty which is concerned with pharmacological, physiological and clinical basis of anesthesia. Anesthesia basically it is the evolution of all the senses and or it includes desestation, intensive respiratory care and pain management. It means it is comprised of various branches. So that as you have seen the first slide regarding my introduction, you can see that we are basically running three specialties in one. One is first is the anesthesiology, second is the ICU and the third one is the pain management center. Now what pre-operative assessment is? The conduct of anesthesia basically begins with pre-operative psychological administration of the preparation of the patient and administration of the various drugs which are used to elicit certain specific pharmacological responses. So this initial psychological and pharmacological component of the anesthetic management, they are known as pre-operative assessment and pre-medication. So basically, whenever the patient comes to the anesthesiologist for the very first time, we take a thorough history regarding various things, which we are going to teach you in next coming slides. And then we administer certain drugs so that the part of the perioperative anesthetic care should run smoothly. So why we do preoperative assessment? So it is basically an interview and it is an opportunity to identify various comorbidities that the patient may have and they, it can cause complication during the anesthesia during the surgery or even in the post-operative period because the post-operative period is very important and if the patient is having certain comorbids like diabetes colitis, like hypertension, like uh, anemia or uh, others, they, they can cause problems uh, in the post-operative periods. Now, what is the suitable time for this pre-operative assessment? So basically, it is said 
it must be done two to four weeks before the planned surgery. Basically, the pre-operative assessment is done for the planned elective surgeries. For the emergency surgeries, basically, the pre-operative assessment is done just before the anesthesia. It is not done prior to several days, hours, or weeks. So, elective surgery, before elective surgery, our plan is basically to optimize the patient and to achieve as much as a success in anesthesia and the surgical uh, outcomes. So there are various advantages of doing preoperative assessment. It actually decreases the cancellation of the uh, surgeries on the day of surgery. It also decreases the morbidity and mortality in the perioperative period. And this in turn actually results in decreased length of hospital stay. And this will prevent, of course, various nosocomial infections also and the financial burden on the patient. When the patient comes for the preoperative clinic, actually the patient has an opportunity to discuss what kind of the various anesthetic techniques are available for the uh, surgery the patient is undergoing. Suppose a patient is coming for hysterectomy, then all the different available anesthetic techniques should be discussed. Like if the patient wants to go general, under general anesthesia or regional anesthesia, and then the method of post-operative pain relief must also be discussed. All the available pain relieving methods, whether they are uh, anesthetic control or they are patient control anesthesia must be discussed along with the, uh, their um, advantages and uh, the shortcomings. In addition to that, all the risk involved in surgery and anesthesia must be discuss with the patient in detail so that the uh, patient can understand the risk involved and decide whether uh, what kind of anesthesia the patient is needs or what kind of uh, whether it is uh, good to delay the uh, surgery and so on. So basically the goals in the preoperative clinics is the optimization before undergoing surgery and this optimization is achieved by various means if the person is a smoker and then the uh, patient can be asked to for cessation of the smoking if there are certain surgeries that require improved pulmonary functions then the pulmonary uh, exercises or even the whole general physical exercises they can be advised the nutritional assessment of the patient can be assessed. And if it is uh, the patient is malnourished, then we can basically advise methods and the prop uh, or the refer him to the nutritionist for the improvement in the nutritional status of the patient. Because if the patient is undergoing uh, like um, some uh, surgery on the, for the, some malignancy or uh, the patient is in a very cachexic state, then the improvement of the nutritional assessment and advice uh, for what kind of nutrition is suitable for the patient in the pre-operative and post-operative period is going to be very helpful in the uh, outcome. Then if the patient is obese, the weight reduction can be advised because there are certain kinds of surgery if, if, uh, that can cause wound dehiscence and other complication if the patient is uh, super, super uh, obese or the weight is not reduced. Then if there are associated conditions like diabetes, hypertension, anemia, and so many others, then this is the basic time to discuss various options, treatments with the patient so that these conditions can be optimized, can be corrected to an extent so that the patient can go under anesthesia and surgery without any adverse event. And these are very helpful. This is also the time when you can discuss the fasting guidelines with the patient. Because before undergoing surgeries, uh, there are 
to the ASA recommended fasting guidelines. Patient must be um, in a nail per orum before undergoing surgery. And there is, is in a clear given guidelines about for how many, four to six hours must be, and there must be fasting before the, uh, after taking solid foods or uh, the liquids can be, clear liquids can be taken one to two hours before surgery. Now, uh, who must uh, do this assessment? A very senior anesthesiologist who is actually, be, uh, the job is only to look after the pre-operative assessment clinic is the most suitable person who must do this uh, exercise. Otherwise, if uh, uh, the, uh, it is also good if the patient goes to the anesthesiologist who is actually going to administer the anesthesia in the operation theater. Uh, in our setup, we, are, uh, we don't have any uh, pre-operative assessment clinic separately, but the anesthesiologists who are appointed at various OTs in neurology, main OT or gyne ops, they do the pre-operative uh, assessments before uh, undergoing uh, before the patient undergoes surgery. It is done uh, one or two days prior to uh, surgery. And if uh, the patient uh, at the time of visit at the pre-operative assessment clinic is not suitable uh, to undergo for surgery, then uh, the surgery is needed to be cancelled. And you know, the anesthesiologist should explain the reason why the case is cancelled. And uh, also, it is uh, conveyed to the surgical and the pre-operative assessment teams also. Documentation is a very, very essential part of the anesthetic uh, management. It starts from the pre-operative assessments, during the intraoperative course, all the documentation can be done. And it is also done in, continued in the post-operative period till the uh, full recovery of the patient or uh, if it, uh, the patient is going to be shifted to surgical ICU for the further management, again, the uh, documentation is going to be continued. And uh, if the surgery is canceled, then when it can uh, take place uh, afterwards, and uh, the anesthesiologist can suggest uh, a suitable date and also the uh, management plans if uh, the patient is having some uncontrollable uh, disease that can be optimized before undergoing surgery in the future. What an uh, anesthesiologist does in the preoperative clinic? Basically, the anesthesiologist uh, takes a detailed interview, then afterward uh, does a thorough general physical and the systemic examination. Then all the necessary required lab investigations are done. Finally, there is assessment of the anesthetic risk as well as of the surgical risk assessment is done by the anesthesiologist. Now let's start with the preoperative history. In the preoperative history, basically, the anesthesiologist asks what kind of the surgery the patient is undergoing and oh, when the surgeries will be performed and if During the preoperative history, the patient is also asked about can ask and confirm about the site on which the procedure will be performed. Like in um, a patient undergoing pilo, the thought of it should be confirmed that whether it is right or left, and it must be documented by the anesthesiologist. In the past medical history, if the patient is having certain comorbids, whether they are cardiovascular, respiratory, renal, or endocrine, a detailed medical history must be taken. Whether the conditions, they are controlled or they are uncontrolled. What kind of medications they are taking and whether they are compliant with the uh, treatment or not. It needs a very detailed past medical history. Because before undergoing anesthesia, there are many medications they may require either 
those alterations or sometimes they need to be stopped in the uh, preoperative period. And on the other hand, there are certain drugs like beta blockers which need to be continued during the perioperative period because otherwise they can lead to various, if they are going to be withdrawn abruptly, they can cause various side effects. In the preoperative history, there are other certain questions which can be asked and it includes if the female is coming for surgery and she is of reproductive age. There must be question regarding the pregnancy should be asked and if the person, the female patient is coming and who belongs to an African or afro caribbean descent, then uh, there may be possibility of the sickle cell disease that is undiagnosed. So the question can be asked about it to explore further into the past medical history. A very important history that must be taken in the preoperative assessment clinic is the past surgical history. If the patient has undergone any kind of the surgery, and if yes, then what kind of surgery he has undergone? When and why? Was there any problem in the post-operative period? In the same way, the past anesthetic history is very significant. We must confirm what kind of anesthesia the patient has received in the past. Were there any problems he has faced? Or what was the post-operative course? Were there any complications? The most important question that needs to be evaluated is regarding the airway problems that would have arise in the perioperative course and also the uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting, whether it was present or not. So that the uh, anesthesiologist who is now dealing with the patient can take aggressive measures to avoid such kind of complications like uh, which are relevant to the airway management or with, which have led to the post-operative nausea and vomiting can be prevented. Drug history is very important as I uh, discussed earlier that a thorough drug history must be taken as some medications they may need to be stopped, they may need to be alteration in the dose or uh, they uh, may need it to be continued without any stopping or uh, dose alteration. Drug allergies they are very important because any drug can cause reaction and in the same way, the anesthetic drugs, as we use many drugs, polypharmacy is uh, the characteristic of the general anesthesia. So uh, the drug allergies, drug hypersensitivities, they are also not uncommon in during the anesthesia. Family history it plays a very important role because there are certain conditions which, like malignant hyper thermia or hyperparexia which can occur due to the um, which can occur due to the induction of the anesthesia with certain drugs like the inhalational agents and the succinylcholine which we use for the um, which is a very short acting muscle relaxant. We will discuss succinylcholine in detail when we will uh, discuss the pharmacological agents. So all the family members must be asked about uh, any history of the malignant hypoparexia so that we can uh, avoid those drugs which triggers this disease in the patient during the uh, intraoperative course. Social history is very important because um, the patient who smoke or patient who take alcohol intake, these things, these two things, they can actually cause problems uh, with the uh, metabolism of the various drugs. They can alter the metabolism of the drug. So it is very important to take this history. When we do preoperative assessment, we also do the anesthetic risk assessment. And this anesthetic risk assessment is very important. Anesthetic risk assessment uh, is very 
uh, important in which we uh, actually classify patients into various groups. This is the American Society of Anesthesiologists uh, grading. In this grade one, we, we label as uh, the patient who are normal and healthy. Grade two, the patient who are coming with mild systemic disease. Grade three, uh, the patients who are coming with severe systemic disease and there is functional limitation of their activities. Four, there is a severe systemic disease and whenever there is a constant threat to life. And fifth, uh, the moribund patients who will die whether the surgery is performed or not. This basically is uh, related to the percentage of the mortality. In the ASA1, there is a 0.1% mortality and you can see that as the uh, condition of the patient worsens, like in uh, ASA grade 5, there is increase in the percentage of the mortality overall. And uh, uh, we label this ASA grade in the patients and if um, the patient is coming uh, as an emergency case, then we can add E. Now after uh, taking the detailed history of the patient, the second component comes, that is the pre-operative examination. This is a very important um, component of the uh, pre-operative anesthetic visit. In this, basically, we perform two kinds of the examinations. The general examination, which includes general physical examination, and the systemic examination, and also the airway examination, because if the patient is undergoing general anesthesia, then we need to put an endotracheal tube in the trachea and this airway examination will reveal whether the intubation is going to be easy or difficult. So it is mandatory for the anesthesiologist to actually do the airway examination. In the airway examination, the anesthesiologist must look for the features that actually indicate whether the airway is going to be easy for the anesthesiologist, for the mass ventilation, or during the endotracheal intubation. And some features which uh, can predict the difficult intubation, they are prominent upper incisors, approaching uh, chin, limited or small mouth opening, People who are obese or they are having very short neck and in patients like with the rheumatoid arthritis, there is stiffness of the cervical spine. There may be disease of the pharynx and larynx that can cause difficult in endotracheal intubation. And uh, if there is some mass, some effusion, pleural effusion or some other lung pathology, it can cause deviation of the trachea. In certain uh, conditions, we need nasal intubation. As a patient undergoing dental surgery or mandibular surgery or tonsillar surgery, nasal intubation is done. And before proceeding, to the pendency of the nasal passages must be checked in whether they are patent or not. A very important uh, airway examination is done through this malampati classification, in which the patient is asked to protrude his uh, tongue without saying, uh, without formation, without saying ah. And uh, by using a, a torch, and uh, this uh, the different classes of the malampati can be identified. Uh, the class one is the uh, class in which it is very easy to put endotracheal intubation. While if we uh, from class one we proceed to class four, it becomes more and more difficult. And we are expert anesthesiologist and various other equipment to facilitate the difficult intubation. After uh, doing this uh, whole examination, so we have gone through some two actually parts of the uh, preoperative assessment. First was the history taking, second was the examination, and the third one is very important, that is the investigations. But again, the investigations, they are required in a very limited number of the uh, cases. So the investigation, uh, what investigation must be sent, what depends upon the uh, age of the patient, 
the comorbidities the patient is having and the procedure the patient is undergoing. Routinely we send um, full blood count, urea lactolytes, LFTs, coagulation profiles, grouping and causing cross match. But if as the person is suffering from diabetes mellitus, the blood glucose levels, hemoglobin A1C, they are needed. If the person is suffering uh, from the renal dysfunction, then the creatinine is required. If the person is undergoing thyroid surgery, thyroid profile is required. So actually, it depends upon the comorbids, age, the surgery the patient is undergoing. If we talk about uh, imaging, then the patient needs um, the routine uh, PCGs, X-ray chest. But again, uh, uh, it depends whether uh, they are essentially required or not. In some cases, if the uh, during the examination, if some abnormal heart sounds are present, then or any other uh, deformity, if uh, structural deformity of the heart is needed to be excluded, then echocardiography is uh, recommended. The preoperative anesthetic uh, assessment is basically uh, done to the documentation. You can see from uh, this slide, this is the uh, chart we are using in which the uh, demographic variables can be seen of the page various patients. And um, you must mention on what date and time you have actually initially uh, evaluated and assessed this patient. Then you will take a detailed history of the uh, patient. Over here you can see this chart is also can general physical examination all and the malam party, including a malam party. You will uh, record the pulse, blood pressure. Then the systemic examination uh, is included in this chart. And all the systems um, specific to the surgery we are, uh, of, uh, the patient is undergoing must need to be assessed. Then there are uh, various investigations. It again depends upon the what kind of the uh, surgery the patient is undergoing and what kind of the comorbid the patient is having. After this history, general physical examination and investigation comes the ASA classification. And as I said, that there is going to be a percentage of the uh, mortality that must need to be identified. After that, the so anesthesiologist, after the, uh, the spray operative assessment, give the remarks whether the patient is fit for surgery and what, ki um, yeah, what kind of anesthesia is going to be administered for this kind of the surgery. And if the patient is not fit for surgery, what are the basic reasons? Then if the patient comes for the second time assessment, then again, the notes are going to be placed in the same file. So this file is very much important. In the same file, you can find uh, the other records, because, uh, other record regarding the recovery of the patient because uh, when the patient recovers from anesthesia, this uh, uh, recovery uh, parameters, they must need to be put. And as we talked about that during the preoperative assessment, all the adverse effects, all the problems that could have happened during the surgery and anesthesia must be explained to the patient. Uh, all the risks which are associated with the uh, regional organ anesthesia, with the surgery, that must be discussed with the patient. And uh, he must not be forced to take the decision about the type of anesthesia or type of this uh, uh, post-operative pain management or at the same time. So the time must, adequate time must be given uh, to take the consent before surgery. Now the second part of the uh, lecture is the pre-medication. So basically pre-medication as the name suggests, these are the drugs which are given before anesthesia. And uh, this uh, pre-medication is basically a preparation of the patient before anesthesia and it actually provides optimal conditions before the surgery. And it is uh, pre-medication is basically is having two components. One is the psychological and another is the pharmacology. Psychological pre-medication basically it is um, the pre-operative uh, visit to the anesthesiologist and it actually reduces the anxiety 
of the patient before undergoing anesthesia and the uh, surgery. While the pharmacological uh, remedication, it consists of uh, the administration of uh, certain drugs before the induction of anesthesia. And it is really done one to two hours before the induction of anesthesia. They can be given orally, they can be given intramuscularly, IV, intranasal, or dermal. And it is uh, will basically be, uh, it will smoothen the induction of anesthesia. The various advantages of administration of the pre medication. As I, uh, we just discussed, that it will reduce the anxiety of the patient. And it's also, it will also reduce the pain of the patient. It will promote the amnesia because we use certain drugs which will cause sedation. Sedation, uh, like midazolam, and it will cause anterograde amnesia. The patient will not recall the events that, taken, that have taken place during the general anesthesia. There are certain drugs which are going to reduce secretion and the secretion of, um, that comes from the various uh, mucosal glands, salivary glands, and they will actually facilitate the endotechal intubation. Then there is reduction of the volume of the gastric contents. We, we use certain prokinetic drugs which reduce the volume of the stomach. And uh, another is uh, the use of the drugs which actually reduce the pH of the gastric contents. This will, uh, by increasing the pH of the gastric contents, the risk of the aspiration ammonitis, which is commonly known as the Madelson syndrome, can be avoided. In the uh, preoperative history, the, we talked about post operative nausea and vomiting. So, there are uh, patients who are at risk of developing post op nausea and vomiting. By using the pain medication, this problem can be reduced. Then uh, these uh, drugs, they are very helpful in increasing the hypnotic effects of the general anesthetic agents. And um, we also use certain drugs which reduce the vagal reflexes to intubation. Analgesia is very important part of the uh, anesthesia and without analgesia, anesthesia cannot be uh, administered. So whether it is systemic or it is topical, like we give for the gene function, uh, it provides a very smooth perioperative course for the patient. And there are certain drugs which can be given in the preoperative area, uh, for, like for the prevention of the inactive cardiac endocarditis, the prophylaxis can be administered. So uh, the three medications, uh, the most famous is the use of six A's, like uh, amnesia, you can use analgesia, you can use um, an anti-autonomic drugs, anti drugs and we can use enzolysis and the enzymes. These all drugs are the same as we just talked. In analgesia, you can give opioids, NSAIDs, and acetaminophen. In the anti-autonomic drugs, we can use anticholinergics, anti-vagolytics agents, and anti salogol agents. Even the beta blockers can be given, short acting beta blockers can be given. Um, to uh, blunt the sympathetic response to laryng uh, laryngoscopy and intubation. We will uh, discuss this laryngoscopy and intubation during the uh, lecture on practical conduct of anesthesia. Enzolysis is very important because when the patient comes to the uh, OT uh, table, uh, uh, the apprehension, the uh, anxiety is at its peak. So the administration of enzylysis is very uh, important. Amnesic drugs like uh, benzodiazepine must be given and uh, uh, all the patients who are at risk of developing post-operative nausea vomiting must be administered antiemetic agents to reduce the uh, volume of the stomach and also uh, to increase the pH as to blockers, PPI, sodium citrates, they are really administered. 
For the angiogenesis, benzodiazepines, they can be administered orally, intramuscularly, or internasally. And mirazolam is one of the uh, best drugs. It is short acting. Other drugs which are used are clonidine and dexmedicine. These all drugs, they are very helpful. But the anterior grade amnesia is the uh, peculiar characteristics that is associated with the mirazolam. When we talk about uh, anti uh, drugs, then the patients who are at risk of developing post-operative nausea vomiting, they are uh, the patients who are having previous history of it, or the patient who are undergoing um, typical surgeries like obstetric uh, gynecological surgeries, upper abdominal surgeries, middle layer or squint surgeries. Female uh, risk is again very much more uh, higher side, and uh, the obese patients. Uh, because they have gastric uh, uh, already, the stomach uh, is almost uh, full and the gastric emptying time is delayed. There's more and more chances of vomiting. Other uh, risk factors are use of opioids, uh, nitrous oxide during anesthesia, and uh, the, volat the various volatile agents. We can use uh, dopamine antagonist like metoclopramide. Uh, for these patients and other uh, most commonly used drugs uh, which are used they are dexamethasone and ondansetron which is the uh, serotonin antagonist so these three drugs metaclopramide and ondansetron and dexamethasone they are most commonly used to prevent the MSs in the post operative period if we talk about analgesia then analgesia without analgesia anesthesia is just incomplete it makes opioids, paracetamol, and cell. So, uh, multimodal techniques for the pain management is very essential during the perioperative course. The advantages, uh, another advantage of using these analgesic agents is that that it decreases the dose of the various anesthetic agents uh, which are required during the anesthesia. It also improves the patient's comfort in the post-operative period. If the patient is pain-free, the mm, patient becomes mobilized earlier in the post-operative period. And uh, in the uh, children especially, the use of the AMLA, that is a eutectic mixture of uh, two uh, local anesthetic agents, if it is uh, applied one hour before uh, the venipuncture uh, for the cannula, it is very helpful. Uh, uh, the antacids which are used during the uh, pre-medication because there are certain patients in which there's increased risk of aspiration and development of the mental syndrome if the pH of the stomach is very low and this is more common is the same in emergency surgeries obstetrical surgeries like cesarean section in the obese patient and the patient who are having hair dysphagia so the most commonly used drugs are the H2 antagonists, including the nitidine that is going to be uh, altered the production as well as the pH of the gastric contents. So uh, 30 uh, ml of sodium citrate uh, used half hour before surgery will uh, neutralize the pH of the uh, gastric contents. So it reduces the chances of the aspiration pneumonitis. Other drugs uh, like clonagam, which are prokinetic, like metoclopramide they would uh, actually enhance the gastric amputing time. And they will reduce, uh, in, of course, the uh, risk factor, uh, risk, uh, risk of factor of the uh, respiration. Then there are certain drugs which are used to decrease the uh, secretions of the salivary glands and mucus glands and the glycopyrrolate that is an uh, antivagal agent is very effective in this. In certain kind of surgeries, like in eye surgeries or during the uh, peritoneal traction, or if the uh, rectal uh, traction is given, then the patient develops vaguely mediated bradycardia. And it is very common in pediatric patients who are undergoing uh, eye surgeries. So, atropine is used for this uh, for the prevention of this bradycardia. So, uh, so far we have seen that there are various drugs which need to be used for this pre-medication purposes. And uh, you know, basically, 
uh, that um, the reason we use uh, these drugs is to minimize physical discomfort and pain and uh, to control the behavior and to minimize psychological disturbances and distress. We may want to maximize the potential for amnesia and also to guard the patient's safety. So, uh, but there are certain factors in which the use of these drugs, it needs to be limited. If the patient is of extremes of age, like the um, geriatric old patients or in pediatric patients, we either uh, do the alteration in the uh, doses or we reduce the number of the drugs which need to be uh, used. Then in, in the patient who are suffering from head injury, again, uh, we don't administer sedatives and if the patient is having altered mental status, again, the administration of the sedative agents must be given with full caution. If the patient is hypovolemic or having some uh, reserve, um, minimal cardiopulmonary reserves, then again, the use of sedatives is, uh, must be done with very much uh, caution. The patient who are coming with full stomach, uh, then the anesthetic plan is going to be changed and the administration of the sedation uh, must be avoided. It must not be done because uh, there are two kinds of the goals for the pre-medication. One are known as the primary goals and the secondary goals. Uh, we discussed this in the uh, advantages. Primary goals are basically the provision of anxiolysis and sedation, analgesia, amnesia, increase in the gastric fluid pH, decrease in the gastric fluid volume, anti-salagog effects, decrease response of the sympathetic uh, reflex system so that the, there must be no tachycardia while doing laryngoscopy and intubation. The patient must remain hemodynamically stable at the induction of the anesthesia and there must be decrease in the dose of the anesthetics by these pre-medicated drugs. While this, if we talk about secondary goals, then there is uh, they actually, these pre-medication, they cause facilitation of the induction of anesthesia, they cause facilitation of the post-operative analgesia, and they prevent post-operative nausea and vomiting. But before the administration of the medication, we must uh, consider certain factors, like what is the physical status of the patient, what is the age of the patient, what is the level of the anxiety and pain the patient is having and what the type of the surgery the patient is undergoing, what is going to be the timings of the surgery and is there any history of drug allergy, nausea, vomiting. These detailed histories, examinations, investigations, they must be done before the administration of the pre-medication. So I'm going to conclude my lecture by just saying that, that basically the goals which uh, of this pre-operative assessment and the pre-medication is to reduce the perioperative morbidity and mortality and also to allay the patient's anxiety. The anesthetic agents uh, should be carefully selected with the patient's need in mind. The purpose of the pre-anesthetic medication is to provide sedation, angiolysis, and analgesia, basically. And a thorough patient assessment and history should be completed so that any agents that have relevant contraindications can be avoided. And a plan must be given to conduct this anesthesia for that particular type of surgery very smoothly. Thank you.